I guess we'll start by just saying that um, I'm here representing two groups, Mustard 21, which is the, the umbrella of which the mustard checkoff goes under and the growers contribute towards the research for mustards in general. And of course, Agrisoma, and to some extent Patterson Grain here as well, who promotes uh, one of the new mustard types, the Brassica Carinata biofuel feedstock uh, crop. So um, I want those people to jump in whenever it suits that represent others as well, those groups I just mentioned, as well as we got Dave Horn here, who's been growing it for a couple of years and uh, he maybe doesn't know, but some of his peers think he's the expert now. Uh, I've had several other farmers refer to your name in a positive way, David. <laughs> So uh, anyways, and he's also helping do a photo journal of his year growing the crop this year too that we'll get to look at sometime later in the year, hopefully, although he's had a few challenges so far, like some hail lately, but um, all useful stuff nonetheless to uh, learn from because we are learning as mustards become something new that they haven't ever been before. I mean, the story is that mustards in general have been fairly unproductive and there's been minimal yield gains, uh, some people say as long as 25 years and nobody refutes that. It's really been a crop that's been stagnant, minimal research, minimal expenses on the crop, and therefore uh, very poor uh, advancement in agronomic performance. So the, the Ag Canada program, with their limited budget for the last 20 years, has worked on mostly quality improvements, and we're seeing that just come to an end now and them take an innovative new approach to breeding mustards, including breaking some of the rules on breeding supposedly self-incompatible crops like the Sinapis alba that you weren't supposed to be able to do traditional breeding with, just population improvement and therefore that limited you. And those models have now been proved wrong with, by Bifang Chang and Dr. Chang has, has kind of turned it all up on its head since uh, she joined. So um, what we see and why I chose Mustard Innovates is because um, we're starting to see from this year forward a real change in what mustard is, what the potential of it is, and certainly what the economic return should be from the crop. And so from that point of view, I want to introduce to you what's happening in each of the three species. And uh, please jump in anytime, and Ken from Patterson or any of the rest of you uh, that want to jump in, please do so and point out any examples or uh, especially you, David, too, uh, of what it's been like to grow the first one. I mean, it's kind of like in an iceberg, you know, see a little bit emerged above water, and that's maybe what David and Patterson have been doing with the uh, Nebraska Carinata. We have a quick summary here of the agronomic unique traits, why it was developed from a producer and a crop perspective, because of the brassicas, it is the one with the most heat and drought tolerance. It did come from Ethiopia. Some people nickname it Ethiopian mustard, so it knows how to put up with tough life, shall we say, uh, heat and drought especially, and, and predictability of any growing year to it beyond the extremes we're used to even. It has the best in cla class black leg resistance, um, which all the other brassicas dream of, because to date we just haven't seen where it gets it at all unless it's the secondary infection when the plant's dead at the end of the year but not the virulent strains. So whether that holds up uh, over many years, we don't know, but certainly the Naples people have been trying to rob those genes from this species for their use in hybrid canola as well. It's vigorous and a very unique growth habit. So that's it right there that Scott's just walking into. It has a very different morphology, short racemes, but many, many and much uh, ability to branch and compensate. So it will end up this back by the tents again, and you'll see a seeding rate study and a fertility rate study, and you'll see how, just how much this plant can compensate and fill. So it's uh, looked at as potential, the first potential new mustard in many, many years, um, as a biofuel, not a feed or a food crop. Not that the meal doesn't make outstanding feed, and there's research being done on that to have it incorporated at higher percentages than today, but certainly as a fuel, it uh, has a lot of potential both for aviation and biodiesel. So I won't go into a lot of detail except on the agronomics because I'll expect you ask if you want to know more and as we walk through I'll certainly encourage more discussion on that but good standability and shatter resistance that was big I mean up at Oyen last year there was a field that took a real beating and still came out with a nice relatively nice I mean half of what was expected by the grower but still when everything else was lost it was pretty nice uh, yield still and we did see under 
tough conditions, whether it was a plow wind in southern Saskatchewan or hail here or wherever, this crop uh, was able to bring in the, some yield despite the worst of conditions. And the shatter resistance, the comment that I got back was, you're not kidding, it is real and it is better than we've ever had before in any brassicas. And of course, in other parts of the world, they've noticed strong rotational benefits when you get out of wheat, wheat, and into a brassica, something tough like this. It sometimes often helps the wheat the next year because you've broken some uh, cycles in the soil, whether it's pathogens or whatever. Um, anyways, when we look at the crop um, and two years of commercial experience we've had, and here's where David's probably one of the experts, since it's only been around two years and that's his history with it, um, is that it responds very well to what you give it for nutrients, responds very well for the moisture it receives, and its flowering period is not short. It can take a real heat abuse and still keep flowering afterwards, unlike canola, which is prone to shut down after an extreme stress. So that gives it the potential, but I wanna, just because I was asked this in North Dakota yesterday at their big tour down there, um, why is there demand for it and how big is that demand? And yesterday I was fortunate to be traveling on the plane with a jet mechanic out of Calgary and he was walking through what they needed in a fuel, a jet fuel in particular, and how none of the bio sources had really delivered that to date. And uh, so he was asking me questions like the total emissions and we could answer thanks to our National Research Council flights last October that yeah it's a roughly 50 percent reduction in emissions on engines stationary on the ground that are being tested with this new fuel. So ReadyJet was what it was called once it was processed by a U.S. group, uh, Applied Research Associates in particular, who make that brand of jet fuel. Um, the emissions were the first part. The black carbon particulates were 25% less, which is an important piece of the, the pollution that's measured from a jet engine. Um, let me just find you some of the other stats here. Um, yeah, 50% reduction in aerosol emissions, 49% black particulates, 25% reduced overall particulates, 1.5% improvement in oil efficient, in fuel efficiency, sorry, and a good level of aromatic, aromatic compounds in the fuel. Now I need to explain those, but as the mechanic pointed out, jet engine without aromatics uh, doesn't work too long because the seals dry out really quick. And the vegetable oils that have been tried to date don't have those compounds and brassica carinata biofuel does. So therefore, they're one of their biggest problems on the maintenance of a jet engine has been solved by the particular oil from this plant. So it's very fortunate and of course some good research as well, but we'll take luck and research anytime um, because all too often we get the bad luck that goes with it too. But in this case, the fuel has been the premium fuel that's ever been tried to make a biojet fuel. And for that reason, like he was quite excited that the potential is huge. And yes, when we talked to WestJet Air Canada here out of Calgary, um, you know, two million acres would not be too much here in these provinces to just meet their initial demand for the next few years. And the whole airline industry is being held to a very high standard where for the next 20 years their uh, mandate is to not add more pollution to the air despite how many more flights they add. And they must do that through improvements in engine efficiency and performance, which has a very short ceiling in their minds, and the rest through fuels. And they see this as one big potential for fuel. And obviously, if you talk to Kevin Falk, the Ag Canada breeder of this crop, or Rick Bennett, the Agrisoma breeder, I mean, they see they can do a lot of things. You see in front of you, um, on this side, A110. Last year, I was here talking about A100, the good variety with 42% oil content, decent urusic, but a bit high in glucs, really good, we're pleasant surprise on yield on that variety. Didn't think it was as close to hybrid canola as it was, but we already introduced A110 this year who upped the oil content by 2% and upped the yield by three or four, maybe 5% as well. And since we could do it this quickly, we did. Just to show um, that the potential here is untouched. This is like looking at Westar in canola and saying that's where we are today, look where we can go. And we have all the benefit of all the tools in breeding. All the molecular work's been laid. The International Germplasm Collection is, being, is held here in Canada now at Agrisoma with over 600 accessions from around the world. Nobody else holds that genetic diversity and nobody else has uh, mapped out that diversity and knows how to make hybrids from day one. And then the next big thing is hybrids. Ag Canada and Kevin have got the hybrid system ready and we'll start testing hopefully as early as next year or the latest the year after hybrids in this 
where you see that, you know, comparable with canolas now, especially under stress conditions, even better. But in the future, add 30% to that, and we think we have a real winner as a biofuel feedstock crop. So that's the tip of the iceberg, and we'll talk more about carinata as we move along. Obviously, right in front of us here, we have a herbicide trial with all three brassica, well, all three mustards, I gotta say, because this isn't brassica, but we're looking at sulfentrosone right here because obviously chemistries are somewhat limiting. And so we think, um, according to the province of Saskatchewan anyways, that we could probably have sulfentrosone uh, emergency label for next spring, especially for the control of kochia. It does cause some damage, which the plant grows out of. Um, you don't notice a whole lot on the Carinata plots there, but they definitely have some damage at the time of spraying, much like some other products we use on other crops today. Um, a little bit more, you can see here specifically with the, the higher rate of sulfentrosone is resulted in slightly later flowering. According to, this is Eric Johnson's study, and accordingly though, it's all acceptable levels, especially for the control we have. And out of the survey of 10 fields I visited here in the last two weeks in Saskatchewan, the number one weed issue was kochia. I mean, I would say out of the 10, probably six of them had a significant kochia issue to deal with, and the other was predominantly wild mustard in there, those other fields. Uh, we're not quite as close on a wild mustard, but we also do have two or three herbicide tolerances that were, or resistances actually, that we're working on as well under Eric's guidance. And hopefully next year we'll have some of those new types in the first year evaluations as well to see if they're high enough to give a herbicide tolerance tool. We're not interested in using the canola technologies um, just to keep the two crops separate uh, because we don't want uh, not to be able to take out Roundup ready canola or more likely Roundup ready this into canola shipments or whatever and complicate the grain industry. So we're trying to keep it simple. It's a yellow seeded crop today, canola is brown. We'd like to use that advantage for visual separation, but we'd also like to make sure that one can be controlled in the other um, for purity reasons. Not that canola or even wild mustard for that much is a huge problem to a small extent in the crop because it still all makes oil that's usable, just not quite as high of uh, suitability for the jet fuel market in particular if there's very much contamination. So we do want to minimize it but we also want to make it easier to grow. That's the main reason for the herbicide resistance research. But when we're talking mustards overall, this is the tip of the iceberg. Um, the other species are not being left behind by any means. This is just the first example of three years uh, of government industry partnership. So under Growing Forward One or DIAP, um, you know, four or five, I guess it was five million roughly was received by the mustard growers to invest in the improvements of mustard crops. So the breeding programs were shook upside down, say how can you do things differently if you've got three or four times the money you've ever seen before? And so for this species, it means hybrids are coming quick. For the other two species here, Juncea and Synapus alba, it also means hybrids are coming quick. But even without hybrids, the genetic diversity that Bifang has been able to work into her material has really led to some yield gains we've not seen before. Both research groups have deemed this Medicine Hat site, working with Farming Smarter, to be a long-term site of most importance. So the plan next year is to increase this site for all three species to not look just at new uh, herb, or, uh, herbicide options and new registrations, but also to look at new elite germplasm, um, meaning the parents for the hybrids and hybrid combinations. So for next year with Synapus alba, using the newest molecular tools that she's now developed in the species as well, and finally, a lot of genetic diversity using some wild uh, accessions from Europe. She's got yield improvements that we think with hybrids should come in at least at 20 to 30 percent in the first few years. And we hope those first combinations are in the field here at Medicine Hat next year. And you're going to hear me keep emphasizing here at Medicine Hat because in early generation screening, you need reliable results, even if it's in tough conditions, and you need to be able to pick the best from, say, 50 or 100 hybrid combinations or parental parents as themselves even for their stress tolerance before you put them into the hybrids. And the breeders would like to see two or three prime sites like this. And unfortunately the Acanda system other than Swift Current doesn't have those sites. So this one is seen as a long term for all three species uh, going into next year. So it will be uh, bigger and that's why I introduced the topic of Innovate Mustard this year because this is one of the prime sites where we're going to show those new innovations every year from here on. 
um, now moving into Brassica juncea. Um, the yield here for oriental and brown mustards has been very flat as well, um, especially for the browns, but the orient ornamentals as well. And with the new funding that was received for the past three years, we now see experimental lines coming in at 30%, but higher than the current varieties being cutlass or uh, any of the browns really. And so it's very easy to see that hybrids are gonna take a nice jump from that even because that's the yield of the new inbreds without hybrids. And the hybrid system is also ready and willing to, to be put to use here. And in Chile now we make the hybrid combinations, increase the parental lines so that unlike the past where we did one cycle per year, we now do two cycles of seed purity and production. And so for example, we have a couple sites of the newest Sinapis alba varieties in production right now, two, site, two plots in Lethbridge, two in Milestone, Saskatchewan. And so we'll get them out in record time. And that's the goal of the grower organization and all grower groups under M21 is to make fast introductions and fast improvements in the mustard species as a collective set. And obviously Karanot is the new flagship with the new total acreage potential of several million acres, but we're not going to forget the old mustards either because they've helped pay the way, pave the way with their checkoffs to take the crop to this point and now it's up to Agrisoma and, and the governments of Saskatchewan, Alberta and Federal to all work together to get a testing system and a research system that makes this a world-class program and stays there. Now we're testing this Carinata in particular in at least 10 US states. It's looking phenomenal as a winter crop as well because it has a free, increased frost tolerance and looks great in Florida with their 50 inches of rain and sand soil. And some of these things are totally un unexpected, but the biofuel market is so big that I think it's 58 billion gallons is the US projection of what they'd like to have in the next five, 10 years. And so to reach that, it's millions and millions of acres on both sides of the, pro of the border. And it can be with other crops too. It doesn't have to be all Carinata. It's just if Camelina or something else finds a fit too, great, because we really can't sa you know, saturate this market, especially when the US mandate is to get food crops out of the biofuel chain. They don't want more corn, soybean, or canola going into the chain. They're not willing to let it go like Europe where 40-50% of the canola is being used for fuel. They want a different crop um, and they want it to be sustainable. Any questions at this point? Yeah. Okay, so we just did a bus tour of Montana with uh, a number of producers and by the end of it we were really getting tired of hearing about Camelina. Um, they claim to have great biofuel attributes as well. But as we know, it, it was a crop that came up. Um, there was excitement generated about it. It's also a biofuel crop. I'm curious as to how does this new venture not fall into the same pitfall traps of the Camelina? Because mm -hmm. it seemed like because the research was funded and then the crop basically died because there was no markets for them, they, them anyways, and issues with the meal. And then the research continued and the farmers were sort of like, okay, yeah. I don't want to hear about it. Yeah. Yeah, the story is even a little more complex. So there was 20,000 acres grown in Florida alone, of which none of it was bought. It was, it was contracted 28 cents a pound, and in the end, they were lucky if they got 10 to 12. And that was three years after the fact, and the original companies went bankrupt. But there was no research first, actually. It was planted in Florida without any research trials. In fact, the first research trial went in the exact same year as the big production and bust and bankruptcy. And so... There was a lot of unsatisfied growers from the price and being stuck with it for years. And there was also a lot of dissatisfaction because there was no herbicides, no production practices, no production manuals, nothing to back up the crop and provide sustainability, even if the companies had stayed in business. So the mustard growers in Egg Canada and Agrisoma and Patterson are all committed to making sure that doesn't happen. We want to take the crop, grow the production plan wisely do the research with people like yourselves, Ken, and with Montana State, North Dakota State, Florida State, Colorado State, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, everybody's in on it. We're gonna host a meeting of all those researchers here in August in Swift Current, where we're gonna try and roll out a plan that says we will do everything possible to stay away from the Camelina model. Nothing against Camelina as a crop, and we wish it all the success too, because together, you know, we can make a bi stronger biofuel play than any one crop can. So if they can develop herbicide resistances and find herbicides that work in it and stay up 
and find productivity and of course get the plant to mature at one point so you get all the seed off in the harvest and not lose a lot on the ground and etc etc um, then all the power to them Kevin Falks the breeder at Acanda for that too and he wants to see that succeed as well okay. and so there's no problem we see as a competitive thing it's actually maybe synergistic that both develop however we're determined not to make those mistakes we're crops left on farm for years price disappointments you were promised to never you know I mean that's the whole idea why we've made this a big partnership and earlier this morning you heard from your politician friend here wherever he went <laughs> if he's still here um, how you know partnerships are the the way of it in this case yeah they didn't have the value chain in place and Patterson and Agrisoma have tried to say you know this is a crop we know how to handle you handle it much like canola we know how to crush it we know how to get it processed now. All the infrastructure for processing is not yet in place. But like the guy I met yesterday, the engine mechanic, he said, you have an oil that meets all the specs better than Camelina, but still it's close enough that you could coexist and blend the two or whatever and still make a good product. Obviously leaning a little bit more on the aromatics of the, gens of the Carinata. But anyways, so there is no magic bullet, Ken, to, to make sure thing hiccups don't happen. But we've been very conscientious, especially on Patterson's part, to make sure that the contracting program is such that we can take the oil, especially while it's only in experimental qu quantities, and make sure it's take used and generate more good, good information for the benefit of the crop, and then nobody's left hanging or disappointed in the, in the process. Thanks. Any other questions? questions? Why is this one so much more advanced than the other? At least it's that's oriental mustard, and it's known for being really early, but also having limited branching and potential. So it's finished, its yield potential is now realized, and it just has to mature, where the carinata will continue to put on pods for a long time yet. Um, so today, it's that plant right there, that line, and those lines beside it, that's about a 22 to 30% decrease in yield on this one, the Juncea. The carinata will almost always outyield it. And so obviously there's a challenge there um, for John Cia to get back up there and they're gonna, you know, Bifang's doing a great job. I mean, the mustard community has really got together and are promoting improvement in all three crops, leaving nothing behind, no poor sister. And I think that's almost an unheard of partnership, the way we've got the multiple stakeholders aligned together in this research area. Any other questions? Okay, if we want to walk towards lunch, um, there's two more Carinata trials over here you'll find quite interesting. One's a fertility rate and one's a seeding rate because as well as the herbicide here that we're looking at having improvements for next year's production, we're also trying to nail down in the different geographies what's the optimal seeding rate and what's the optimal fertility rate. So we've put in some ridiculous seeding rates over here and some obviously common ones. And I mean, ask David what he uses and what his neighbors use on the crop. And, uh, you know, it's certainly not the excesses of seeding rate or fertility that you see there because it is a crop that doesn't demand super high fertility rates. I think the, the average last year was around uh, 50 to 60 pounds of N being used on the average field. Some as high as 110 and some as low as 20. This site has 40 roughly on the soil tests and the, uh, the experiment back there adds 30, 60, 90 and 120 to that. And obviously some of them are way over the top, no advantage to them. It doesn't take at this current yield levels anyways, it doesn't take a really high level of fertility. Okay, we want to wander back there. One last bit of exercise before lunch. Okay, for those that made the trek over here, um, all this is pointing out is, you know, we're serious about getting an agronomic manual put together. and We've got a Growing Forward 2 application in that hopefully uh, we get some good news on shortly, which would fund the next five years of reading and research. And a big part of that is to establish all the agronomic information over multiple years to make a really sound grower's manual to ensure that if this crop starts an exponential growth, that the information's there to have people be successful and that we have the herbicides and the fertility recommendations so that people know if, you know, if I've got such and such a year in front of me, I've got some soil moisture, I want to aim for 35 bushels, 
then this is what I need to do for fertility, etc. So it's going to take a few years and a lot of sites to collect that. Obviously, we hope to have the U.S. come on site and start collecting it as well. And Haver is a really good site that David and I were just talking about that has done some great work for me. And hopefully Peggy can start doing that because it has a lot of relevance to us here too. And we can collect more information faster with more partners. But right here, we're looking at 30, 60, 90, 120 pounds of nitrogen added. Obviously, the crop with the 40 in the soil and roughly 30. Uh, come take a look at it and see what you think is the right rate, but it's, it seems to be not needing any of the higher levels, at, certainly at this site anyways. And then the seeding rate next door, um, go look at the two pounds per acre was really miserable and is, but it's amazing how this crop can fill it in when it gets some heat and moisture. So go choose your favorite. Right now we're recommending six pounds. Um, some growers this year upped it to eight but uh, obviously there's some that did four and three this year too. So uh, it's all managing your farm, your moisture, your inputs, and uh, what you're willing to invest. But certainly there's some good examples here of the agronomic information we're trying to collect for the new crop. And that's it, I'm gonna let you go at this point. Just take a walk through, see what you think, and uh, then I'll let Ken feed you or <laughs> whoever's gonna help Ken County feed you. Uh, join me in thanking Daryl for the presentation, eh?